Thank you and welcome back. Um, I will be talking about a subject that we've been touching upon in the meeting so far a few times. Um, a new global apparent polar wonder path that we made based on site level data. That work was entirely done, uh, almost entirely done by Bram Vast that you see here, who handed in his thesis on this subject last week. Um, and you've heard about this a little bit. Uh, this is a, a website that we made mostly because we ran into the problem that um, everybody has different formats. And if we want to combine data sets from different labs or none of the softwares uh, were able to do that, at least not the ones that we had. So um, we made um, uh, this tool and um, for an interpretation of paleomagnetic data, you can have a look if your lab is on there. If you would like to have the, the format of your lab added to that, let me know and then we can uh, add that to the list. Um, before I go into further detail, I just want to have a short memory of Roberto, who should have been here and who unfortunately cannot be anymore. Okay. Apparent polar wonder paths underlie um, much of what we think about Earth history, about pa paleoclimate, paleobiology. It's the sole quantitative way uh, to, to place relative reconstructions of the Earth's surface um, in, in uh, a relative to the Earth's spin axis. Um, and that has obviously been of paramount importance for paleoclimate, but also for, for geodynamics. And we use then the apparent polar wonder paths as reference to interpret um, tectonic, uh, 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 interpret tectonics, for instance, here for the Himalaya, uh, that you will see, hear Stu about more. Um, and we compute, we use the apparent polar wonder path to, to quantify rotations or paleolatitudinal motions of one block relative to another block. And those apparent polar wonder paths are based on paleomagnetic poles, compilations of VGPs that somebody took in a particular location and computed a relative pole. And what we then see is if we take a, a continent fixed, we see that the, the, the magnetic pole appears to have wandered over the Earth, whereas in reality, it is the continent that has moved by plate motion, a true polar wonder. And the way we compute these apparent polar wonder paths is uh, uh, classically, Classically, we simply take the average pole, we ignore the uncertainty of the pole, we ignore the amount of data that feed into that pole, and we ignore the uncertainty, the uncertainty in age. We take the average age, average pole location, and then in a given window that we choose, we combine all poles that fall with our average age in that time window. And then we compute um, an uncertainty, and the uncertainty is, is given as an A95, as a Fisher A95 uh, around that set of poles. Um, and then we use that A95 and that pole to compare a data set that we collected, uh, for instance, in the Himalaya with its own A95 and, com and, and compare those two and try to quantify motion. The problem is, however, that the A95 of an apparent polar wonder path is based on an average of poles, which each are averages of EGPs. And we compare that to a set of average VGPs from some location in the Himalaya. So we are comparing here data on two hierarchical, hi hierarchical levels. <clears throat> and this has been known for a long time, and people have been thinking about this for a long time, um, that, we should, uh, that, we, that we should do this better probably, and we're not propagating any of the errors into the apparent polar wonder path, but it is computationally difficult to do that, or at least you get less less intuitive data that are, and you, you need more uh, work to uh, to use that for your computations. And it's a lot of work. And it was all, always unclear why it was really important to do this. Because the intuition was when we were, for, for instance, I co-authored the, the, the apparent polar wonder path that is now widely used of Tron Torsi. And we've been discussing it already 10 years ago. But the intuition was, it's not really going to make a difference. So it's a lot of work. And why would we do it? And then came a paper by Dave Raleigh in 2019. It, it was published two days before Bram Vaas started his PhD. Um, the PhD of Bram was not supposed to be about paleomagnetism, but about mantle frames. But it said, uh oh, we have something else to solve first. This paper was written in a, in, a commence, in, in a response to a commensal reply that Dave and I had on a paper he wrote in Nature Geoscience, in which he argued that uh, 3,000 kilometers of craton subducted and that we should rewrite the books of geochemistry. And I said, but paleomagnetic data show that India was, had a different size from what you 
um, concluded in your paper. And then he argued the following. He said, you cannot use paleomagnetic data to infer um, paleolatitudinal differences less than 2,000 kilometers, because if we compute in the apparent polar wonder path of Torsvik, if we compute the, diff the distance or the difference between each pole that fed into the apparent polar wonder path and the average pole of the apparent polar wonder path, then 50% of the poles are statistically significantly displaced relative to the apparent polar wonder path. Which basically means that if you find a significant difference between a study pole and an apparent polar wonder path, you get a 50-50 chance that that is geologically meaningful, which is terrible. And it basically blew paleomagnetism applied to tectonics and paleogeography to bits. And he, he suggested that we should use another measure, namely the, 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 the in this case, the circle, the, the confidence region that encloses 95% of the poles in the apparent polar wonder path. He called this an a, a K95. And the K95 of the apparent polar wonder path of Torsvik varies between 16 and 22 or so. So that basically means that any rotation that you would compute less than 20 degrees or any paleolatitudinal motion that is computed less than 20 degrees, 2000 kilometers is statistically insignificant. And that was a bit of a problem. It was also counterintuitive. I've done a lot with paleomagnetism and it's not that bad, but his, it, it isn't. But his argumentation, I think was very strong. So the first thing that we did is to try and analyze why our poles around an apparent polar wonder path so scattered because every pole, every author that wrote that that published the paleomagnetic pole argues that paleosecular variation is averaged and therefore out, which is clearly not the case. It's averaged, but it's not out. And what we found, we've we've tested a whole bunch of different things. What is the cause of the scatter or dispersion of poles around an apparent polar wonder path? And this is one of the most important findings. Poles that are based on low N, on the low amount of spot readings of the field, are scattered twice as much as poles that are based on large data sets, which is completely logical. And that means, um, and the big problem is that, um, okay, so the more VGPs you use to compute a pole, the closer that pole will be to the apparent polar wonder path. The amount of poles, the amount of VGPs that we use to determine a pole is completely arbitrary, right? So that means that given a data set of VGPs, we can choose to have low N per pole. That makes a lot of poles. We get a low A95 because that is mostly dependent on the amount of data that we use. And we get a very large K95 of data. But with the exact same data set and a different choice of how we distribute those VGPs over poles, we can get the opposite. We can make a low K95 and a very large A95 by taking a lot of poles per, a lot of VGPs per pole. That means that essentially the uncertainty around the parent polar wonder pass, the way we've made it, is arbitrary. We can choose it at will, it's unreproducible, and there is no rationale of why we, uh, of how many uh, uh, sites we use for a pole. To illustrate, in the uh, apparent polar wonder path of Tron of 10 years ago, there were eight poles from the Deccan traps, and N varied from three to 130, and the weight that we were assigned to these poles is equal. We could have made an infinite number of poles, or one pole, or whatever, we could have done whatever we wanted with it. And that arbitrariness is unavoidable if we use on pole level. That means that we should stop using poles to make apparent polar wonder paths with, and we should go to VGP level, to side level. The problem with that, however, is that we have, as a community, never published the data on side level. For lavas, we typically do, at least on uh, lava side level, but for sediments, we typically don't. So one of the, the way we over, overcome this now is to see, um, oh, this is, before I go there, uh, this is another cause of scatter. Uh, sediment, sediment-based poles in the apparent polar wonder path of Trond are more scattered than igneous poles. Also, this is intuitive. This is not unexpected, but uh, and which is probably which is probably to do, for instance, with inclination shallowing. 
<clears throat> but this is a, a, a worry. We have to also have, a, we should have a look at what we do with sediment based poles. Okay, are there other sources of scatter? Um, age uncertainty does not really indicate, uh, is a problem, of course, but is not the main source of scatter of poles around an apparent polar wonder path. And this was a bit of a shock. This is the famous Q factor of, uh, of Rob Vanderveu that we used in the apparent polar wonder path that has been used before for spline fits, for instance, to, to await data. We find that there is absolutely no correlation between data with different Q factors and the scatter that they make around the apparent polar wonder path. It's even worse. The, the poles with the highest Q factor are the most scattered. So this is not a way forward if we want to improve apparent polar wonder paths. If data, the Q factor should basically be on or off. If you have no Asian resolution, then you can have a Q factor of six, <laughs> but I wouldn't use the data, yeah? But the problem is that we don't have the, we don't have data at site level. So we, we have tried this trick um, we've analyzed PSV10, the data set that was compiled, I think, mostly here. Huh? Um, uh, we've used PSV10, and, and we have resampled, parametrically resampled PSV10 from the poles that went into the data set. And from PSV10, we know the actual uh, uh, sites. And what we then saw is that we reproduce, we reasonably reproduce PSV10, Except, um, um, although the, the, the parametrically resampled data set is slightly more scattered than PSV10 was. So it is by parametrically, by, by parametric resampling of a data set, we get a conservative estimate of the scatter. Scatter that we impose is a little bit higher than what the actual scatter was. So this is the way we go forward now by making so called pseudo VGPs uh, that we uh, parametrically sample from the statistical properties and the N that is reported for polls. So the first thing that we now had to do is look again at quality criteria. What are criteria, objective criteria that we should use if we compile polls for apparent polar wonder paths? And that started with the master thesis of, uh, of Dika Gerritz, who's now a PhD student with Stu, um, <clears throat> who has tested, we have studied four large data sets of which we had, um, uh, of which we had um, the data on site level from volcanic provinces in the Miocene of Turkey, from my work, Antarctica from Lisa's, uh, Lisa's group, Mongolia and Cretaceous from my work, and Norway uh, in the Permian from, uh, from work at the FORC. And we I, re I reinterpreted this blindly. So I have simply t made um, uh, directions um, or CHRMs by saying everywhere between 20 and 60, that is my CHRM, regardless of whether this is junk or not. So in the data set that we have is definitely 20, 30% junk. Probably not in Lisa's, but certainly in mine. Um, and <clears throat> we wanted to see if we could um, remove the junk data with widely used fil filtering factors and whether the pole position and precision changes when we use these um, objective filters. So one filter that is typically used um, and that comes from procedures for, by, by people who want to understand v, um, um, VGP scatter, for instance, is to uh, say that, that lava sites should have a minimum K value. And we expect spot readings, so we should have high K value. So you can take a K of 50 or K of 100. If we do that, um, for I'm not interested in a K value when I have a pole. I'm interested in A95. That has to be small. And if I apply K values, uh, K cutoffs, the only thing that the pole position didn't change significantly, the only thing that I do is kick out data so A95 increases. But it nowhere, nowhere helped to improve the pole, not in precision nor in location. It deteriorated pr uh, precision. Requiring a minimum number of n to determine um, uh, um, a lava site average. In red here, you see the average, uh, the A95 of a pole that is computed based on sites with NS6. And what you see here are the um, uh, bootstrap um, average pole positions based on NS1. And what you see is that in 91 to 100% of the cases, the pole that we compute based on with one single measurement per lava site falls within the A95 of the one with six. So there's no improvement. 
for a poll. I try to discard the farthest outliers. If you have six or seven directions, you can try to kick out, let's say, the one, two, or three worst performing or farthest outlying data points. Makes absolutely no difference for the poll position or precision. What does have a major effect is that I have a limited amount of time in the field. So if what we tested here is suppose we can take 100 directions and we distribute those directions on one direction per site or seven directions per site, then this is what happens. The angular distance becomes much smaller and becomes what? Uh, so angular distance, A95, A95 plummets with increasing N. If you want to get a high quality and a precise poll, then take 100 sites if you can. Your data set will not become worse by taking five samples or seven samples per lava. That's, that's okay. If you have the time and you're desperately want to seven, measure 700 samples, go ahead. But it doesn't improve the data set. And if you do it, if you, if you collect multiple sample sets per site at the expense of taking more different and more lavas, then you're basically wasting your time. And I've wasted a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. The second thing is we had to look at, at the reliability of sediment-based um, lavas. What we need for a VGP-based, uh, for a site-level-based apparent polar wonder path is a reasonable confidence that the data that we call VGPs are actually spot readings of the geomagnetic field. And for a sediment, that is always the question because within a sediment, you may average some uh, time or the acquisition may be a bit later, or maybe diachronous, or there, there's always, and there, there's an uncertainty in sediments, what we're actually measuring. Now, uh, the method of Lisa and Dennis, the EI correction, explicitly assumes that the, the set of distributions that we have is VGP induced, or is, sorry, is paleocycular variation induced. So what we tested with an enormous data set that uh, Shou Li, uh, got from Eastern Tibet, a data set of something like, what is it, 1,275 directions. He desperately wanted to have a magnetostatigraphy. Um, we have tested under what conditions um, the EI correction um, uh, reproduces the paleo latitude that uh, can, um, I'm not sure whether you were involved in that study, but anyway, your, your method of, of uh, of correction was applied in that in that uh, basin, and we had uh, large lava sites, large lava-based uh, samples of which we know paleo latitude, and we have paleo, we have tectonic reconstructions, and all three came to the same latitude. And what we tested with a moving average, so here you see a moving average of um, uh, uh, of a corrected. So we did uh, the EI correction on 100 samples, and with the 25 sample moving average, moved that over the over the section. And what you see it here, and this is what we eventually used, is when the A95 dips below um, a value of the A95 that in 2011, in a paper with Marta and Dana, we deemed uh, as the minimum that you can explain with paleocircular variation, you see that the EI correction gets very strange um, corrections, that suddenly, according to that correction, we would move to, uh, towards the Arctic. Um, and this is in these um, regions, mostly the result of rotations that exist within the section because they increase the elongation and then uh, your, your A95 goes to hell and also your elongation goes to hell and therefore you get crazy, uh, uh, crazy values. So based on this analysis, we formulated, um, um, we formulated a, a series of criteria under which we can um, accurately uh, under which the EI correction seems to work very well. It mostly means that we need very large data sets in which we have no evidence for, for rotations larger than about 15 degrees. Those data sets, those sediment-based data sets, um, will be, are included in the uh, compilation of the global apparent polar wonder path. All other sediment-based data sets are excluded. And then we made uh, a new global apparent polar wonder path database that database includes PSV10. Those are all the, the diamonds that you see. Uh, and you see that those are also in origins uh, where we have no other uh, data because there are all sorts of local deformation going on, but not on these short time scales. And then we have, uh, uh, we, we started with trans databases basis. Um, so we did not look older. 
of his database of he had 350 or so uh, polls. Um, there are 162 that survived the new scrutiny. Um, so these were mostly the sediments that fell out, but also duplicates. Um, 71 are for BSV10 and 117 are post-2011 published data sets. Um, and we included the Antarctic Peninsula, um, China, and Iberia that were not included in Tron's work. And we've updated the plate circuit according to the latest insights. And then made an apparent polar one pad. Now, the way we've done this is the following. We wanted to propagate uncertainty. So we have, um, and uh, uh, one thing particularly is the uncertainty in age. So what we've done is we have, um, um, we have a bootstrap method in which in, um, in one go, we resample all poles that um, fall, uh, of the apparent polar one path. And we assign each pseudo VGP a random age within the um, age range of the poll. And then we compute an average poll for an interval. And we, we took here a 10 million year interval and a 20 million year uh, sliding window. So all pseudo VGPs with an age in that interval are then averaged. And we get one poll. And this we do 2,000 times. And each time we uh, redraw all the samples from the entire distribution. And by the way, we do this in situ. So we do this uh, in the location, in the, in the coordinates of, let's say, Eurasia. Um, we resample. Then on the age of the resampled pseudo VGP, we rotate it through the plate circuit into the coordinates of Africa. And then we make an average. So this way, the uncertainty in age and also the uncertainty in um, well, the uncertainty in age generates an extra uncertainty because you have to, uh, there's plate motion in this time window. And this is also taken into account. Moreover, the uncertainty that is associated with the EI correction is also propagated into the eventual scheme. Now we do this 2000 times, we get 2000 poles and the circle, the, the confidence region that encloses 95% of those poles is what we now call the P95. And that is taken as the uncertainty of the apparent polar one path. And here you see all those poles that are parametrically, or that are, uh, uh, that, that came from the bootstrap. Now, one thing that we can test is if there is, if all we sample is paleosecular variation, we should get K values that are typical for paleosecular variation, somewhere between 10 and 50 or so. Um, if there is a major contribution of additional uncertainty, a scatter and inclination shallowing and rotations and whatnot, then that should deteriorate. Now, what we see for the entire time period, these are pseudo VGPs, these are not real um, VGPs, of course, but what we see is um, uh, that the K value varies between about 15 and about 35, which suggests that the dominant source of scatter that we're looking at is PSV. It is interesting that in the supercrons, the scatter is much lower than outside. Whether that is a sheer coincidence or not, I don't know, but this is something that I think we'll come back to after Matt's talk. Um, you also see the amount of data. So PSV10 makes for an enormous spike of 2,500 directions or so. Uh, we have an enormous spike here, which is around well, the, age, the age barrier fell, fell off, but that's, I think, the, the camp. Um, in the Jurassic, the amount of data that we have is really low. And now we have a way to way forward to improve apparent polar wonder paths again, because we, we can, if you have a good section in France somewhere, for instance, then please go and drill Germany. Um, here you see the new apparent polar wonder path that we computed compared to the one of Trond. And what is reassuring is that this is a very different data set and a very different method, but the apparent polar wonder path is essentially the same. That is reassuring. If this would have been completely different, we would, would have been, we would have had a mild problem. <laughs> but so it's, it's not, it's not that bad. There are, uh, the, the main changes are, um, there is around 50 million years, there's a difference, which is interesting for discussions in India, for instance. Um, this is mostly um, uh, the results of, of how poles were distributed. And this is also a kind of a reinforcement syndrome. We had the so-called Asian inclination problem. This is because we first collected data from North America and then went to China, and then China had the problem. Had we done it the other way around, we would have had the North American inclination normally. <laughs> but this is not what the literature now says. 
Um, if you actually combine all the data, then you get a scatter. The scatter there's nothing wrong in the scatter around 50 million years when this inclination normally is supposed to happen. The same goes, by the way, for Pangea. The Pangea AB discussion, we've used the Pangea A fit here, but we see nothing in the field or in the Jurassic. We see nothing in the field in the scatter that suggests that there's something systematically wrong. Um, so we have a few mild changes, and the uncertainty has decreased considerably because the, we use the actual data, or at least a representation of the actual data. We use the actual N. One, um, there's one worry, of course, if we use very large data sets from sediments, could they systematically deflect the apparent polar wonder path? So to test that, we have here made the same parent polar wonder path, but we have kept n of set of, uh, of um, uh, or we have cut off, um, um, we've limited the poles from sediments to 50. So n is 50. So if we had data sets of 1200, like like Shu, um, then we kept that, uh, cut that off at 50, and you get essentially the same APWP. So that is not a main. Uh, um, uh, main source of uh, an, not a big worry. One thing that is interesting this way too is we can compute the actual age of the poles. Uh, this is an approach that Bessel Cotillo already did 20 years ago. Um, we have combined all the data from a 20 million year interval, and then uh, we say that is for the poles 20 plus or minus 10. But if there is a large igneous province at 19, then the average age of the of the poles actually drawn towards that large igneous province, which is a much bigger data set. Now, the interesting part is that if we if we compute the true age of the poles, then almost all big peaks in the apparent polar wonder path disappear. So the we get very gradual um, uh, apparent polar wonder for for Africa. This is an African coordinate. Should we rotate this in Indian coordinates, we get a spike, of course, because India has a spike. We get one. We have one spike left between 95 and 82 million years, and that spike is um, one that we put in. This is Daria Bura, um, and she wrote a paper last year um, in Nature Geoscience, whereby we have new poles from the supercron uh, based on on uh, Roy Grano's variations of uh, of magnetic noise, and they show that Africa had a, a spike between 92 and 85. Or 92 and 80 million years. So this spike in uh, plate motion, we see back in the apparent polar wonder path. So back to Rowley's problem. Um, we haven't solved that problem yet. In fact, we have made it worse because um, if we decrease the A95 of an apparent polar wonder path, then the chances that the poles that fed into that apparent polar wonder path would make um, a statistic and a significant difference if we compare the P95 with an A95 of a reference pool, then in this case, 40% or 37% was displaced. So we overcome that by um, doing uh, one extra step, one extra bootstrap, bootstrap step. We weigh the reference pool against the N of the site, or the, sorry, against the N of the collection of the pool that you want to compare it to. So if you go into the field and you collect a pole based on 15 lavas, we recalculate what the reference pole is, had it been based on 15 lavas. And so we do the exact same bootstrap approach, but now instead of combining all data in that, uh, in that window, and we can do that precisely in the time window, that in the time uncertainty of your reference pole. So we don't have to choose a 10 million year uh, apparent pole wonder path pole for your the 13 million year uh, pole that you got in the field, if you have 13 plus or minus three, we compute a reference pole at 13 plus or minus three. And then we draw from that, that set of data in 13 plus or minus three, N data of your pole, and then compute a so-called B95. And the B95 becomes smaller, uh, the more data you have in your, um, in your pole. And, um, so we have P versus B95. The P95 is then the confluence column that encloses 95% of the bootstrap pseudo poles. And the B95 is the same. But now in each iteration, only N uh, pseudo VGPs are drawn. Uh, and those make then a pole with the B95. Now, with this approach, about 10% of the poles of the global parent polar wonder path are displaced. 
So it's not quite a 95% confluence limit. Uh, for, PSV, for the PSV10 database, that would be 93% is not significantly displaced. So now we're going into a point that if we find a statistically significant difference, that we can be reasonably sure that we're looking at a geologically meaningful difference. And it means that demonstrating a smaller difference requires a larger data set. And now we have statistics as they make sense, because that is precisely what we have to do. So finally, I'm wrapping up. Um, the problem, and what is less elegant about this than the way Tron has always done it, and Bessa Cotillo have done it, is that if you get a value of an A95 in a pole, you can compute very easily what the differences are, and now you have to do everything bootstrap, um, which is something you can do easily on your, on your calculator. So we made um, apwponline.org, where you can compute, based on your own data, your own apparent polar wonder paths. Uh, you can make the apparent polar wonder paths, and you can calculate rapid, uh, relative paleomagnetic displacements. This is, for instance, uh, on, on, a, on a pole level, the relative paleomagnetic displacements, of course, from Adria relative to Africa. Is For those of you who are interested in the Pangea problem, um, this shows, and this is if you do that on, a, on the apparent polar wonder path, this shows you should not use the poles from Adria if you want to uh, compute uh, Pangea because it's rotating. Um, but here you, so now you can, compute the differences between apparent polar wonder paths or between your study pole and an apparent polar wonder path. Um, and everything goes with a bootstrap method. Um, and it's computed on your uh, in your browser. So it's not that you upload the data to me and that I can then quickly publish them. Finally, there is the database that we, uh, that we made that you can download. We intend to update that database uh, with a new version roughly every year. Um, and we are bringing together a group of wise people uh, to review once a year the new data, the new polls, to go to higher versions and make sure that this keeps uh, as that this is updated. And if there is a real change in, uh, if it really makes a difference for the apparent polar wonder path, then we will write another short update for it. If you have data, there might be data, for instance, that you have on your computer, but of uh, that we need for an EI correction, for instance, and then that poll can go into the apparent polar wonder path. Please upload them because we can improve the reference with which we do a lot. So I think that um, thanks to this guy, um, we um, have a paleomagnetic reference frame now that is more precise than it was. Um, we can improve it with large new paleomagnetic data sets. It's not that you do all that work for n is one new pole and that disappears in the in the statistics. You can actually really make a difference now. Um, I think that Dave's problem is solved. Now we have to show him that his argument in India was wrong, <laughs> but it took four years to show it. So um, <laughs> it was a, it was quite a quite a task. And uh, on this uh, online tool, we made sure that it's easy and user friendly. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's really fun to see all, all put together. It's just for fun talking about from with from. Uh, I see he's been on this on this on this journey on this good results. Um, it was the I'm really happy that from quickly went to implement this actually propagating the the half factor uncertainty. Yeah, you yeah. used your um, yeah Jane Pierce's work. Well, right? yeah, the, the, the sort of turnaround that incorporation. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess I'm curious about how you're sort of implementing that in the online tool, basically, right? So you run the app method, a great thing about it is you bootstrap your sample and you get a whole sort of suite then of possible, possible app factors. And one of the issues that we highlighted in that paper, as you know, is that the way you know, folks can do it is you're like the app factor that applies to the whole instead of propagating the uncertainty. So I'm just curious for technically how you're sort of dealing with that, because it kind of seems like you actually need that full bootstrap list of possible F factors for that data set um, to then implement your base sampling procedure. So it's like that getting archived in the online tool. No, yeah, well, you have to talk to Bram about this because if if I would have been able to compute this and do the math, then I would have done this in 2016, but I, I can't. <laughs> so this is where I needed him. Um, the uh, I do not exactly I cannot exactly reproduce how he has done this. He has written he has explained this in detail in the in the paper, but he he found a way I think to um, um, essentially the uncertainty of the EI factor is concentrated along a rate circle, and he found a way to bootstrap that 
into the into the whole procedure to to bring that into the whole procedure. Yeah. Okay. So maybe that can do it with the tent uncertainty. I think so. Okay. Cool. But uh, I'm glad they rally motivated you to go on, but I think that there's a fundamental flaw in that paper. I could be wrong, but uh, equation four of that paper, it's not an alpha 95 or a B95, it's a B99. And that's why I never used that paper. I think it's, I think it's not right. Well, but I think that the, the apart from whether it's right or wrong, I think his point that the, the, the fact that 95% or 50% of the data are statistically displaced relative to the apparent polar wonder path is a big, big problem. And what was interesting, I wrote a comment on that paper too, not because I disagreed with that uh, observation of him, but because he said, um, because every single pole um, might be within uh, his K95. Um, so I, there were like 15 different poles that are all plotting about 20 degrees from the apparent polar wonder path, but each individual pole fell just within his K95. So he said, ah, throw him overboard. I said, dude, if you take 14 poles and they all plot on one side of your average, there's a one in a million chance that that happens. I said, well, I just combine all your poles into one. And is one inconclusive. And he could, because that is precisely what we're doing. It's just, you can combine randomly what you would like to combine or split it. And this is where the discussion went bankrupt. <laughs> no. <laughs> um. So this is really cool, and I think it's a great job. And this is uh, an intelligent approach. I was wondering, one of the reasons I was so excited about the um, uh, Brendan's uh, trout method is that we can go from the measurement data, objectively pick components, <laughs> because I know if you look at his iron oak diagram, I look at his iron oak diagram, I have come up and and banner moon has his own somewhere. Um and and then go from that with some uncertainty points or on that direction from the specimen of why I'm into sites right? and then propagate the uncertainties all the way up to the poles. And this is sort of what I was thinking about describing. I completely agree, and this is what, what we will hear in the next half hour. Um, so we have taken a shortcut by the parametric resampling, and that is born out of necessity because for many of the polls, particularly the stuff from pre-2000, pre, pre there is very little chance that we can get the actual data. Yeah, so one of the things that you're going to get is that, um, um, no, you, you won't. Um, so, um, so that with that that shortcut um, is in there, and I think that we can make a lot of improvement if we have the actual interpretations and the uncertainties of the interpretations. So we can go deeper, but at least I think that the the first problems that really stopped me from using PaleoMag in the way I always did are now hopefully uh, out of the way. I probably don't understand all of what you just said, but like the Morale um, problem you mentioned, it looks like he's just confused standard error and standard deviation. Um, so a lot of this is a different 95. I don't, I don't, I'm not quite sure what you're saying. I measured from this table a million times. Most of the measurements are going to fall outside of the 95% confidence limit that you get. Yeah. So the problem is not so much that the A95 of the apparent polar wonder path is unreliable. Um, it is the way we measure a, a difference between a pole and the apparent polar wonder path. If in 50% of the cases, the poles behind an apparent polar wonder path are statistically significantly displaced relative to that apparent polar wonder path, then in 50% of the cases, we would argue that there is a tectonic rotation of, of these poles relative to the reference, which there isn't. That, that is why we chose them to make the apparent polar wonder path in the first place. And that is a real problem. So it is, our, for paleoclimate models, it's fine, use the A95. Okay, you can, you can change it a bit, but 
the the way um, and we go into the field we collect one set of samples from the himalaya we say there is a 10 degree difference therefore there's a thousand kilometers of motion that is that that doesn't work this way uh, again if, if i was measuring the tape or out the measurements that didn't fall the gap of 95 they were part of the, the observation that created the distribution so again i think it's it's a difference between the standard deviation and the standard error which is basically the standard deviation divided by the server the number of observations you make and for one of the table, you multiply that by 1.96 and you get the fact that you fly for the length of the company circuits. And most of the data would fall outside of those company circuits. Yeah, but those data themselves do not have an uncertainty. Whereas here, the poll, so the problem comes in because we use an uncertainty of poles that are based on VGPs and an uncertainty of an apparent polar wonder path that is based on, a, on a, the uncertainty of the poles that each have. And that and, and that this there's a disharmony between those, and that makes that uh, that I well no I think it is and I think that that many of the uh, more subtle tectonic interpretations um, are indeed unsupported by the data if you use this approach. And now no, 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 just to repeat that there's no sort of basis for what a, what a Fisher mean of a collection of paleopoles can be. Like there isn't a reason why, like if, you're, if you step back to the VGP level, there's a reason to step in. And I think there could be circular symmetry here. Yeah. Uh, that my dominant source of noise, you actually have some model of it that's failure second variation. Whereas what that actually is when it's just a running mean of failure poles for the arbitrary group. Um, and, and they're probably, you know, typically that shouldn't be to carry it, right? You think a lot of times there's actually a play mode in this in the long game. So anyway, which I just think it, this is a different than your question, which I appreciate, but it is, it, there's, there's a lot of motivation to step back that higher level. Well, I agree with that, but at the same time, if you wanted to know if your statistics were correct, you could use produced chi squared, and you should end up with a, with a value that equals the number of parameters you're trying to solve for. If not, you could enlarge your uncertainties such that you get a, the proper average for what has the proper statistical behavior. So that's something that has been done. So Richard Ward and myself and others have done that. So when you have a, a pool that has an alpha 95, you don't need to know how many flows were there, how uncertain that flow is. So you use weighted averages of pools. And if you end up getting an average pool that has uh, an unrepresentative uh, reduced chi squared value, you know that you underestimated your errors. And that's kind of the basis of how average I'll have a look into that whether this still applies to the new approach that we have but I think that the problem that we still had is that the um the a the a95 of an apparent polar wonder path itself is to, is arbitrary is is depending on arbitrary choices of how you combine data it, it be. Um, they're, they're probably not arbitrary they might be misrepresented because the uncertainty yeah okay thanks um i think we probably need to move on we can discuss uh, this uh, at the break possibly all right thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>